Hello, my name is Amanda Maxim and I'm a writer and a research associate at the Ayn Rand Institute. And I'm delighted to be here at ICCC 10, uh, adding my voice, calling for rationality in the debate about climate change. Let's get started. This year, thousands of bills, regulations, and measures were passed and policy decisions made. Across the board, whether it's plastic bag bans or banning of incandescent light bulbs, to delaying of the Keystone Pipeline or shutting down coal-fired power plants, increasing number of these are aimed at combating climate change. We're told that we're facing a grave danger, one that requires big policy action from bold leaders. What actions are required? Well, cutting fossil fuel use in order to reduce emissions of CO2. Practically everybody's on board with this idea. Out of the G7 summit this week, the global economy must be completely fossil fuel free by the end of the century. Prominent environmentalists like Bill McKibben and Greenpeace, they want us to cut our fossil fuel use by 80% or more. Bill de Blasio, he's mayor of New York, he puts it this way. He says, quote, cutting emissions is crucial, crucial to addressing climate change and protecting future generations, unquote. Even some on the right tell us that we need to cut emissions, but they want to wait until less industrialized nations like China or India cut their emissions first. Even the oil and gas companies tell us that they're committed to working on better energy solutions like solar or wind. Here's what's happening in the policy world. If your law, whether it's delaying a pipeline or banning an incandescent light bulb, if it's aimed at climate change, it's seen as a policy slam dunk. It's like climate change goes in the machine, you turn the crank, and out comes cut back on energy use on the other side. It seems like we're all on the same bus marked, fossil fuels must go. And we're just quibbling over how fast it should go. Almost nobody's offering a positive alternative that makes any sense. But since we're talking about huge possibilities, important to civilization as a whole, so whether that's from the risk, the supposed risk of climate change, or the implications of cutting back drastically on fossil fuel use, I think it's critically important to take a step back and look at the big picture. So first, let's start with the conventional view. And I'll leave it to President Obama to tell us the conventional view in a nice little nutshell. He tells us, quote, 97% of scientists agree climate change is real, man-made, and dangerous, unquote. So the first thing to point out is that it seems like in any discussion about climate change, three things, three packages always get delivered together. It's real, it's man-made, and it's catastrophic. I want to unpack them each. Let's start first with the it's real package. Yes, climate change is real. As you've heard at this conference, human, uh, the, fact that, the facts are that the greenhouse effect is real, that human beings have increased the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide from about 270 to 400 parts per billion in the last 100 years or so, and the global average temperature has risen about a degree Celsius in the past 150 years. But carbon dioxide is a weak driver of warming, and models that are used to back up um, the idea that we're heading for a catastrophe are unreliable. They fail to predict anything in the past 30 years. So thinking about the it's a catastrophe package, there's no reason to think that we're heading for a catastrophe, but I'll leave it to the rest of the scientists at the conference that you've heard yesterday and that you'll hear today for the details. I want to talk a little bit more in depth about what I see is the real looming catastrophe. I want to talk about what's often ignored or brushed off in the policy debate, and that's the, the benefits of burning fossil fuels. Now, if you're a climate crusader, you may be thinking, I bet I know what she's going to say about the benefits of burning fossil fuels. Now, I mean that increased concentrations of CO2 are beneficial to plant life, and that warming could be good for mankind, since cold weather is a far bigger threat. As one book on climate change um, it acknowledges that these may be the sort of tarnished silver lining of climate change, but it goes on to say that these negative consequences, quote, dwarf the handful of helpful ones. And there is no question that in the grand scheme of things, climate change is unequivocally bad for humankind. Really bad, unquote. So these two benefits, they need to be included in the debate, and they need to be included when we're weighing risks and benefits about climate change, but that's not what I mean by the ignored benefits of burning fossil fuels. Because we're not talking about some dull silver lining in a mega storm um, that's coming our way. We're talking about a giant, continent-long mountain range of pure gold right in front of our faces. 
one that's completely absent from most books on the subject, including that one. What's this mountain of gold? Well, it's that the use of fossil fuels has been overwhelmingly positive in people's lives. And instead of a, causing a catastrophe, fossil fuels have allowed people to adapt and to mitigate climate risk. In other words, the real catastrophe would be cutting our use of fossil fuels. The claim is that by burning more fossil fuels, we're making the climate more dangerous. Bill McKibben puts it this way. He says, quote, the choice of doing nothing, of continuing to burn ever more oil and coal, will lead us, if not straight to hell, then straight to a place with a similar temperature. He goes on. A few more decades of ungoverned fossil fuel use, and we burn up, to put it bluntly, unquote. Environmentalists and climate scientists have been making claims like this for over 30 years. But what's the actual track record? Well, in the last 30 years, around the globe, people have increased the burning of fossil fuels by about two times. Fossil fuels have been the overwhelming choice when it comes to producing more energy, especially in poor and non-industrialized nations. But even in the United States, we've increased its consumption. Now, taking the advice of politicians like John Kerry, who have called on poor nations to cut their carbon footprints, in China and India, for example, the use of coal and oil went up by a factor of five. The result? Was it a catastrophe? Far from it. In fact, what happened was the exact opposite. It led to a legendary improvement of people's lives across the board. Take China and India, for example. Lifespans there increased by almost 10 years in each country due to uh, the, the cheap, reliable, and plentiful energy that fossil fuels bring. 10 years. Can you imagine what 10 more years of life would mean to you or to someone that you loved? Infant mortality rates plunged, and GDP um, rose in those countries also by many fold. Other things that make life better. Global malnutrition and undernourishment went down by 40%, and about 10% of the, more of the world's population got their first clean water source since 1990. More people each year get their first washing machine, tractor, dishwasher, or stove, thanks to the concentrated power in fossil fuels. That's the incredible benefit that we've gotten, that the world has gotten by burning fossil fuels. But what about climate danger? Because getting your first washing machine it won't make a snowball's difference if we're going to burn up, as McKibben puts it. Well, Inder Goklani, he's a science and technology policy analyst. He gathers data on the number of people who die from things like extreme heat and cold, floods, droughts, storms. And looking at this data, as Alex Epstein points out in his book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, it's a really great book. Um, he says that climate-related deaths have gone down by 98% in, in the past 80 years the time when CO2 emissions have most rapidly escalated. Epstein says, look, it's, alarmists weren't just off by a little bit or by half. It's not like they ordered up a catastrophe and got half a catastrophe. They were off in the wrong direction entirely. In my words, it'd be like looking for an electron and finding a positron. Why have climate-related deaths gone down? Why has life gotten so much better? It's because we cannot take out of the big picture our ability to adapt. Mankind will always face climate issues, and access to cheap, reliable, and plentiful energy determines how we will fare in any climate. It allows us to build our own safe harbors. And that's what the world needs more of. The real catastrophe will be going to, along with environmentalist plan and cutting access to energy, as that is what keeps people safest from the climate. OK, let's go back to our, our packages. What about the It's Man-Made package? Let's do a little thought experiment. Let's imagine that in the 1970s, the scientists discovered the sun was experiencing some sort of an anomaly that would cause the global average temperature of the Earth to heat up by, say, something huge. What do you think people would do? My guess is that they'd try to actively mitigate the dangers. They'd probably move away from dangerous places to safer ones, invent biotech crops that could grow better no matter the climate. They'd build shelter and indoor places that have climate control. Hopefully they would repeal any law that limits access to energy so that we would have the machine power to make all of that happen. Politicians would have applauded the things that happened in, in the past 30 years in India and China. They would have cheered them on rather than asking for them to cut their carbon footprints. But that's not what we hear when we hear that it's man-made. But it's a red herring, right? Because we shouldn't care about climate change because of what's causing it. 
Instead, I think the It's Man-Made package is included because it's supposed to activate a moral context that most people have when thinking about environmental issues like climate change. It's included because it reinforces the view that we're taught, that any impact that people have on the environment will be bad. This is how it stands in most people's minds. It's a trade-off between human beings and the environment. When one thrives, the other takes a dive. This is a moral view, and it's one that is not too fond of human beings. As stated in the Interfaith Moral Action on Climate Change is called action, they say, quote, to disrupt the climate is a moral failure of the first order, unquote. In other words, they're saying that mankind changing nature is immoral. Or as Bill McKibben puts it, he says, quote, though not in our time and not in the time of our children or their children, if we now, today, limited our numbers and our desires and our ambitions, perhaps nature could someday resume its independent workings, unquote. Do you hear what he's saying? He's telling us that by mankind having ambitions and desires, now that means you working hard to move from an, from an apartment into a house. That means you driving your car uh, to the grocery store to buy ever more plentiful food. He's saying that these actions are immoral. Why? Or at best, they're necessary evils because they impact on nature. As Alex Epstein points out, Whenever we hear a moral argument, it's important to be clear on what standard is being used to judge. Environmentalists, they're not using human life as the standard for judging what's good or what's bad, but rather impact on nature. But since anything that human beings do to improve their lives, whether it's planting a garden or building a skyscraper, involves changing or impacting nature, there's no way to be truly moral in this worldview. On this view, human innovation, human well-being, and human flourishing are dispensable, and they should be sacrificed for the goal of not impacting the earth. In my view, moral clarity implies exactly the opposite. The standard of what we call good or bad needs to be human beings. Because what makes human beings great is their ability to innovate, to improve the environment. That's what human happiness and flourishing requires. We need to become champions of the energy that powers our society and the freedom that makes the ingenuity to be progressive possible. Consider the hundreds of actions that environmentalists call on us to make in the name of climate change. We're asked to shut off the lights, switch off our power-consuming toasters and dishwashers, live without using any resources. We're asked to wait just another few years for a pipeline that could safely bring oil down from the north we're asked to shut down coal-fired power plants in favor of intermittent and expensive energies like solar and wind. We're told that cutting back, that reducing our consumption and using less energy are, more, are moral actions. Back in 1970, just months after the first Earth Day, philosopher Ayn Rand spoke about many of these time-saving and therefore life-saving technologies. And she asked her audience to seriously consider what it would mean to live without them. Today, the environmentalist movement is asking us to renounce these in the name of climate change. And when it comes to policy based on climate change, we're no longer being asked, we're being told. In that speech, the anti-industrial Re revolution, Rand says that if we understood and took seriously the aims of the ecology movement, we would scream and protest. Why? Because Rand recognized that, quote, it is technology and progress that the nature lovers are out to destroy, unquote. She knew that the things that they are out to destroy are indispensable goods in people's lives. It's the electric lights that allow us to study at night, the heating and air conditioning that allow us to com comfortably bear bitter winter nights and sweltering summer days. It's the chemical insecticides that keep us safe from malarial mosquitoes, the plastic that keeps food sanitary, the asphalt roads and fossil fuel burning vehicles that allow us to escape when nature serves up an earthquake or a hurricane. It's the tractors and the biotech crops that allow us to grow, safe, or grow plentiful food, come rain or come shine. It is these things that environmentalists scoff at as wasteful luxuries that we should give up. Yet people don't protest. One reason Ryan believes that they don't is that people take technology 
and its magnificent, magnificent contri contributions to their life for granted. I think this is exactly what environmentalist leaders and politicians are counting on. Rand said that industrial capitalism and the amazing boon to human life that it makes possible is being, quote, hidden under a mound more impenetrable than the geological debris of winds, floods, and earthquakes, a mound of silence, unquote. It's time to speak up in defense of cheap, reliable, and plentiful energy because it makes human life great. Don't let your voice go unheard. Thank you.